Hi, I'm Jan Witkowski. I am director of the Banbury Centre here at Cold Spring Harbour. And this is the third afternoon of the 80th Cold Spring Harbour Symposia on Quantitative Biology. And the title this year is the is 21st Century Genetics, Genes at Work. I'm very pleased to have Dan Glitman with me from NYU uh, Skirball School of Medicine. Uh, Dan, I've not, you've not given your talk yet. Not so, yet. No. So can you give us a, a brief overview? Not, yeah. not. I'll give you. I'll you give you give a, a the, preview. Right. I, you needn't give us these. You know the spoilers. No, but, uh, not this. Well, the best part is the spoiler in a way. But uh, uh, I was here a couple of years ago when I did one of these in which I talked about the microbiome and uh, about the enormous diversity of the microbiota that inhabit our bodies, uh, with which we live in a. Uh, in, in a mutualistic kind of relationship. And what we've learned over the last uh, five to ten years is that there is a uh, very close relationship of particular branches of the human microbiota with individual components of the human, human immune system. Uh, we, of course, study do most of our studies in the mouse, uh, and it seems that it's very similar in the mouse model uh, and in humans as to how different kinds of uh, cells of the immune system can be influenced uh, by components of the microbiota. We were very fortunate a few years ago in that we were studying a particular type of cell called a T helper 17 cell, uh, which is a T lymphocyte that is very important for the protection of barrier surfaces in the body, of the skin, of the lung epithelium, uh, of the intestinal epithelium. Uh, and uh, these cells make cytokines that basically reinforce the uh, integrity of the epithelium mm -hmm. and also produce uh, various uh, mediators that attract neutrophils, for example, that will gobble up uh, either fungi or bacteria that may uh, penetrate through a damaged epithelium. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we found is that these cells are most uh, common in the small intestine. And uh, we very fortuitously found that some mice that we had in the colony uh, that were of the exact same strain in one set of cages had a lot of Th17 cells and another set of cages had very few in their gut. And uh, a very uh, uh, clever postdoc in our lab, uh, Ivo Ivanov, who is now at Columbia, figured out that that had to do with their exposure to microbiota. So if you actually put these mice now in the same cage, all of the mice had a lot of Th17 cells and we were able to go on and identify one particular bacterial species. So, but, but these are mice in, in cages in the same facility, getting the same water, the same food? They're getting the same water and the same food, but they came from different sources. Okay. And even oh, though right, they were right. of the, uh, the same genetic background, uh, C57 black 6, they had vastly different uh, uh, populations mm. of microbiota, mm. and one particular microbe accounted for this uh, difference in T helper 17 cells. So since then, we've been trying to understand what is it about this particular microbe that can induce T helper 17 cells. Are there human microbes? This is a microbe that's present in many rodents. It hasn't yet been uh, identified uh, in humans, but can we identify human microbes that have similar properties? We're also able to show in collaboration uh, with Diane Mathis and Christophe Benoit at uh, Harvard Medical School that animals that had uh, SFB, the segmented filamentous bacterium, the name of this bacterium, uh, had a lot of, not only a lot more Th17 cells, but also had a propensity to develop autoimmunity. Uh, uh, so, so let me just put, so if, if, the, if this bacterium didn't induce these extra cells, is it, is it bad for the mouse? I mean, well, the mouse is then more, more susceptible to uh, uh, enteric bacteria, for example, uh, because the barrier is not as well protected. Mm -hmm. so, those, so enteric bacteria that normally are tolerated very well can now uh, break through the uh, epithelial barrier, through the mucin layer. The mucin layer uh, in the gut is not nearly as robust. Uh, so they are definitely uh, beneficial for us. 
uh, or for the mouse in this case, mm. and I'm sure that we have those kinds of bacteria too. But the flip side is that the induction of these kinds of cells can actually precipitate autoimmunity if the genetic background already predisposes to disease. And uh, in this model with a group at Harvard, uh, we found uh, in a spontaneous model of uh, arthritis that uh, the animals were much more susceptible when they were colonized mm. with the bacterium, and that was due to the uh, increase in these uh, T helper 17 cells and in their production of one particular cytokine, interleukin 17. So, uh, so I was going to ask you about the mechanism, what lies behind this increased tendency to autoimmune. It's the, the, the increased production of, of... It's the increased production of the cytokines by these T cells. But there are... And we went on uh, soon thereafter to show that in human, uh, humans with rheumatoid arthritis, there is an association with one particular bacterium, uh, one species called Prevotella copri, uh, but we have not yet been able to show causality there. Mm. In the mouse model, it's not that difficult to show causality. In human, it's much more difficult. So we're trying to see whether we can now uh, mimic uh, or reproduce the disease process in mice with the human bacterium, with the human colonizing mm. bacterium, mm -hmm. with Prevotella copri. Uh, but our goal now is to try to understand what is it about a particular bacterium that will induce uh, these inflammatory T cells? A group in Japan led by Kenya Honda uh, at around the same time identified a different set, set of bacteria, uh, classes of Clostridia, that can induce regulatory T cells. And the regulatory T cells basically have the opposite kind of function in that they uh, restrain the inflammatory T cells and can actually prevent autoimmunity. Mm. So clearly the balance between these kinds of bacteria leads to a balance of the different kinds of T lymphocytes uh, in the, not only locally in the intestine, but also systemically. Uh, and that contributes to a homeostatic condition uh, that we would consider to be healthy. Uh, so what is it that makes one bacterium induce T helper 17 cells, another one induce regulatory cells, another one induce uh, T cells that make interferon gamma, so-called T helper 1 cells. That's what we've been studying. Mm. And in the process, what we have learned is that uh, the bacteria that are induced by the segment, I, I'm sorry, the T lymphocytes that are induced by the segmented filamentous bacteria are induced in the draining mesenteric lymph node by dendritic cells that take up pieces of the bacteria from the epithelial surface, transfer them through lymphatics to the mesenteric lymph nodes, and there uh, create an environment in which they polarize the T lymphocytes to now become Th17 programmed cells. And by that, what I mean is that they now turn on a transcription factor that's a nuclear receptor called ROR gamma T. So this is a ligand-dependent transcription factor. We are not precisely, uh, we haven't precisely identified the ligand, but we think that it's in the cholesterol biosynthetic uh, pathway. Uh, but uh, in order for uh, the cell to make interleukin-17 and the number of other cytokines associated with Th17 cells and with uh, uh, pathogenicity, uh, you need the uh, ROR gamma T transcription factor to be upregulated. So that's what we call the program. Mm -hmm. But what I'm going to be uh, showing uh, during my, my presentation is that that is not sufficient to make a, an effective T helper 17 cells. These cells now go throughout the body, including throughout the intestine, but only where they receive a second signal will they now activate uh, their effector functions. And that second signal? And that second signal we found to uh, require products of the epithelium. Mm. Uh, a secreted product, uh, or actually two of them that are closely related, called the serum amylo amyloid A proteins, SAA 1 and 2. And those are induced through a separate pathway that involves a different kind of lymphocyte, which is an innate, an innate cell. And the segmented filamentous bacterium also activates these innate cells, which work through a short loop right in the, uh, in the mucosa of the gut. Mm. And this short loop involves the induction of another cytokine called interleukin-22, which acts on the epithelium. The epithelium, in turn, then makes the serum amyloid A. And the serum amyloid A interacts then with the programmed T cells to activate the effector program to activate interleukin-17 production. 
So, so when I hear somebody talking about these sorts of interactions and pathways, my immediate thought is, is how do, how do these things get set up? Uh, is it? Uh, do you have any idea about the the evolutionary background to this sort well, of sort of network and we system? Have, we have no idea evolutionarily how how this actually got structured, but we do have some hints. Uh, the innate lymphoid cells are particularly interesting because these are these are cells that have only in the last uh, five six years mm. really come to prominence. We've missed them for uh, for decades, uh, in large part because we didn't have the phenotypic markers or the antibodies to detect them. But now now we can identify them very clearly, and these cells go back quite a ways in evolution, uh, and uh, uh, they uh, we think that these are cells on onto which the uh, recombination machineries that are found in B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes mm -hmm. have been superimposed evolutionarily. For example, the RAG recombinases. Right, right. And, uh, but they, in, in more primitive organisms, we think that they had very similar functions to what T lymphocytes have in, in us. Uh, and they now uh, work in coordination with the T lymphocytes. And they, uh, since they have some of those functions, they are actually employed by the T lymphocytes to achieve their maximal uh, activity. Mm. And that's how we think that these sort of got added on uh, evolutionarily. Right. So the innate lymphoid cells were there already and protecting epithelia to some degree. Mm. Now the T cells come in and can protect in a more antigen specific yes. way, uh, but using very similar kinds of, uh, uh, of principles. Yeah. I mean, this is, an arg this is sort of the uh, creationism argument which in almost a degree I was making that how do these complex things get set up? It must be, must be a designer. But evolution works in the way that you said. You take, you take something existing like these innate cells and then you, you tinker with them and then you build on them. And, and almost it's precisely the counter of what, what a designer, would, That's designer right. would do. Yeah, there's, uh, uh, you know, I, uh, I described this whole process as kind of a, uh, a Rube Goldberg contraption because yes. it's so... Uh, it, it's so complex in terms of all the different players involved, the multiple cell types, the multiple cytokines, the multiple loops, just to achieve an activation of a T helper 17 cell. Although in the process, you're also activating many other things that we have not really considered that are probably very important for the integrity of the, uh, of the barrier and that can eventually contribute to disease. So the second part of the story, which I'm going to touch upon, has to do more with the mechanics of how the, uh, the T lymphocytes that's programmed to be a TH17 cell uh, activates the effector, uh, the effector machinery. And we think this is actually quite interesting and potentially very important because one could imagine that this is what happens at those sites where the system uh, goes awry. Mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, for example, in uh, multiple sclerosis, uh, in draining nodes to the central nervous system, there may be activation of inflammatory cytokines by these cells that normally would just be making raw gamma T but uh, be minding their business there. Uh, now, that is purely a hypothesis, but we'd like to really understand mechanistically what might be going on. Is serum amyloid A present in those sites? And we're looking to see if in sites other than the gut epithelium, there is production of serum amyloid A that might uh, do this uh, uh, so that T lymphocytes that are not necessarily specific for cells, uh, for myelin or for uh, collagen in the uh, uh, in the joints uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, nevertheless would be activated uh, to make these potentially damaging cytokines. So how does this happen? So to do that, we've been studying this transcription factor, ROR gamma T, and looking for what kinds of proteins are necessary for it to activate its targets. Uh, and I told you already, a key target is interleukin-17. There are actually a couple of different interleukin-17 molecules, but they're dependent on ROR gamma T uh, function. So we found a RNA binding protein that associates with ROR gamma T, uh, and this is a so-called dead box helicase called DDX5. And this is an essential gene. Uh, if uh, you knock it out in mice, it leads to a lethal phenotype, but we can just knock it out in the T lymphocyte lineage. And what happens then is that Basically, we protect the animal from T helper 17 mediated pathology. There's very little induction of IL 17, even though the number of ROR gamma T positive cells is still normal. 
So we think that the second step of activating the effective function requires this interaction of raw gamma T with DDX5. We're going to have to stop in a moment. Can I, I'm going can to I, give you, can I give you just a last one? Maybe this can. is a spoiler, but the way the DDX5 interacts is through a non-coding RNA. Uh -huh. And it binds this non-coding RNA called RMRP, which has been identified in patients with a disease called cartilage hair hypoplasia. It's a Mendelian disease, so since we are here celebrating 150 right, right, years right, of right. Mendel's uh, discovery, it's a Mendelian disease that actually has many different allelic variants uh, that can lead to disease. Uh, it's a recessive, uh, a, uh, autosomal recessive disease. Um, and it's a disease that results in dwarfism, but also in uh, defects in T lymphocytes. And uh, this interaction, trimolecular interaction, between DDX5 with RMRP bound in there that now allows it to interact with our gamma T seems to be required to activate this T helper 17 program. Uh, so that's what we are really excited about studying these days. Yeah. Talking to Arnie Levine, he was, he was talking about how there's a general movement from using mouse to model or to study things, actually into studying human beings. And uh, you, this is presumed a, a similar sort of uh, Well, it's a similar process. thought. I mean, we, we try to go back and forth. I mean, with our arthritis work, we've gone from discoveries in the mouse to studying microbiota in human, but now we need to go back in the mouse to understand mechanics, to understand mechanism. And the same thing with uh, the ROR gamma T function. Uh, we are uh, now studying patients with cartilage hair hypoplasia that we're getting from various clinicians. Uh, but at the end of the day, to really understand mechanism, we need to do the work in the mouse. Right. So. Dan, thank you very much. Okay, it's been a great pleasure. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.